a theatrical movie made to keep the He-Man cash cow going that also retcons the series somewhat? Let's examine this thing. The story per IMDb is, Prince Adam is sent to the world of Athera to find his long-abducted sister Adora and awaken her to her own destiny. Now, most people that know of this film don't know it maybe as a film, but they saw it originally as a five-part limited series back in 1985. It comes on the heels of the conclusion of the He-Man TV series. It seems that while the show, toys, and popularity were waning, there was still some interest from the suits at Mattel and Filmation to continue on the gravy train. The movie begins with a jazzy musical opening. I want the universe to find her, for better or for worse beside her. It kind of reminds me of the never-ending story thing. Anyway, we then skip to the sorceress dreaming about being a model. Maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's Actually, she's having a dream of some guy stealing a baby. She's awakened by a sword hovering over her. Hmm, Sigmund Freud will have a field day with this scene. This leads to her telepathically contacting Prince Adam to tell him to come to Castle Grayskull. And nah, a moment too soon. With that terrible bull story and discipline, he'll suffer from severe carpal tunnel syndrome within the next five minutes. Okay, I find this next scene questionable. The sorceress tells Adam to take this sword and go through a magical door that just appeared out of nowhere and to find who this sword belongs to. When he tries to get more info from her, she says, Adam, please, ask no questions. Until you find this one, I can say nothing. The very fate of the universe may depend on your success. Balderdash. This is a silly way to start a mission. That's like saying, hey, here's an am bomb, and I want you to go to the United Nations to see who it belongs to. You want more info? Well, kick brick, son. It's pretty obvious that she knows more of what's going on, and she's just not telling him. You know, that can really hinder his mission. Also, another BS statement that she made was... I would go myself, but as you know, I have no power outside this castle. Yeah, right. I seem to remember a specific episode where she had an adventure outside a castle. Then again, that might have just been the 2000s remake. Okay, fine, until I can prove otherwise. I'll allow it. Once Cringer and Adam arrive to this new land, instead of starting their search, they decide to grab some chow from a very questionable restaurant. Okay, I know this guy couldn't possibly be a villain based off of that absurd mustache. Question, just how is Adam going to pay for his and Cringer's dinner? Will they dine and dash? Will they use some weird universal currency that I don't know about? I need answers, movie. Okay, the horsemen enter the restaurant and act like they own the place and they want some food and drink. Uh, how do they eat? We never see a horseman's face in this movie, which makes Fluffy, or whatever his name is, statement a bit weird. The time a horseman ever smiles is when he's doing something awful for someone. <laughs> You know, I don't like that look that bar owner's giving Cringer once he found out that he can talk. Yeah. Well, after Mustache Lad and Adam literally pull the rug under these dum dums' feet, Mr. Stash takes Adam to the Whispering Woods. Meanwhile, Hordak is getting an update on what's going on. Before I go on, I gotta admit, I really like these backgrounds and Hordak's Headquarters also looks good. The design reminds me of something Jack Kirby would come up with his New Gods series. Anyway, Hordak's alert of Adam's presence. Hmm. With Catra, were the filmmakers going for Batman 66, Eartha Kit, Catwoman with the design? Heck, even sounds like her. So he sets up a trap and ends his speech by showcasing his toy's laser blast feature. While this is happening, Cringer, Adam, and what's-his-name make it back to the Rebellion headquarters and are threatened by Blueberry. After getting ogled by Glimmer, the Rebellion's leader, who shows more emotion here than she and most of the characters for that matter show for the rest of the film, we meet the Oracle of this world, Madame Raz. <laughs> You 
you can tell this is supposed to be the comedy relief character when you see a couple of the characters taking bets on her crashing into a tree. Well, per Madame Raz, because of the incident Stash and Adam started, the Horde enslaved the entire town. Okay, before going on, I don't want this to become a thing, but were the animators overworked or did they just not care? Because I think Glimmer is supposed to be upset, but she has the same blank expression nearly every character has exhibited so far in the film. Heck, the only time she showed any emotion was when she got a boner looking at Adam the first time. Anyway, the Resistance go and stake out Beast Island and spring their attack. It doesn't go well. Okay, who is this guy and how is this thing not a meme? Wait, his name is Suckerface and he's stealing energy from her? How would the audience know? It just looks like Glimmer is participating in some new agey massage therapy. Well, all looks lost until Adam does this. Okay, I know it's a joke by now, but really, no one sees him turn to He-Man? Uh, sure, let's go with that. Oh, now we see physical evidence of Suckerface sucking energy. He-Man does his thing during which he delivers a particular bad burn. That's not very ladylike. <laughs> of course, you're not much of a lady anyway. Ooh, <laughs> during this, Balcat chases for some pussy. Okay, He-Man takes on Force Captain Adora and all goes well until the other sword starts glowing, showing her in its reflection. He gets distracted and taken out. Okay, despite all that, I think the Resistance was successful. We don't see anyone that they saved, so I can't be sure. So, after a commercial break, I'm not kidding, the gang are back in Whispering Woods trying to find He-Man. Wait, weren't they just near him during the fight? Couldn't they have had someone follow him? Or maybe he's still in the location you just left? <sighs> well, after an unfunny joke, Madame Raz conjures up a ship for them to save He-Man who's in prison on Beast Island. Meanwhile, on Beast Island, He-Man's chained up in what I assume is kryptonite based on the weird green glow and chats with a door. Most of the people are good citizens loyal to the Horde. Only because they're afraid, and with good reason. Liar! The Horde are just rulers, kind, generous, and caring. You can't believe that. Haven't you seen how the Horde treats people? Well, I've spent most of my life training in the Fright Zone. There's been little time to see the rest of Etheria. Then why don't you do it, now? Or are you afraid of learning the truth about the Horde? I'm afraid of nothing. Then you'll go? I'll think about it. I could just imagine with that smirk on his face at the end, he's thinking, Gotcha, bitch! Well, the Resistance makes their way to Beast Island, but run into Hordak's ship that shoots them down. But for reasons only known to him, he doesn't bother checking to see if they're actually dead. Wait, did his screen just blink, die, die? See, I told you, right there. It's not really gone into, but I find the relationship between Hordak and Adora interesting. I get a bit of a parental vibe from them. I'm surprised that this wasn't played up more in the TV series. We didn't find the gang just strolling the force when they get attacked by a rock monster. Of course, Madame Raz being the orco of this film makes things worse and Balcat has to clean up her mess. Later on, Adora leaves Beast Island to call on He-Man's bluff. While that's happening, the gang finds Hordak's base and they're easily noticed and they can't believe what they see. Where there's a whip, there's a way. Where there's a whip, there's a way. While this is happening, a sheltered adorer finally sees the horde for what it is. Not that it'll matter as we'll see in a few minutes. The resistance walks into a trap, but thanks to Balcat being a boss, he gets them out. Adora continues her world tour, seeing the atrocities that the horde commit, looks angry about it, but then does nothing. So the gang finally find He-Man, but they get captured. Fortunately, he's saved by Kyle. He-Man saves the gang and they escape, but not before he destroys the prison. Later on, Adora confronts Shadow Weaver and Hordak about the evil that the Horde do, and they respond by knocking her out and putting a spell on her for her to forget everything. Hmm, my plot hole senses tingling, 
when the series begins, couldn't this be the same answer that Hordak could do in every episode to her? Later on, Hordak shows off his new toy, the Magnum Beam Transporter, aka a teleporter. It transports things to the Valley of the Lost. He plans on using it on Whispering Woods and the Rebellion. Uh, did the filmmakers have to zoom in on Hordak's crotch right then and there? The ray uses the energy of willpower. Wait a minute. He's weaponized willpower? Some lawyers at DC Comics would like to have a word with the filmmakers. Also, how do you drain willpower? Can't willpower be replenished? He says he needs more rebels to power the beam up, but after which they use them as slaves. So, if that's the case, what's the point of them powering up the beam if you have a machine that can make your enemies your slaves? I don't think he's thought this plan through. Adora finds this disturbing even though you wouldn't know it from her expression here. Back at the Rebellion headquarters, which look completely different now, Adam still has plans to look for Adora again. Did Cringer just break the fourth wall? What's with these Dutch angle shots? After Adam turns into He-Man, he pulls a Star Wars and disguises as a Horde Stormtrooper, uh, I, I mean Hordesman. This doesn't work because Hordak and Shadow Weaver aren't idiots. I don't think that it was the filmmaker's intention, but this scene with He-Man and Adore has a very has a very Stranger Danger vibe to it. Hordak and his minions ambush He-Man and Adora takes him out easily. Now, are the Hordesmen Armor like the stormtroopers, are they weak against laser blasts but strong against things like punches and clubs? Hordak plans to suck up He-Man's willpower to power the beam. Adora objects, but she has another spell put on her. Isn't this like the third time this film that's happened? The sorceress finally does something useful and summons Adora to He-Man and the sword's location. She also reveals that He-Man is her twin brother. Is this really a spoiler to anyone now after 33 years? Well, she transforms into She-Ra and saves him, but not before the beam is fully powered up. She tosses him his sword, and he receives a quick power-up. Hordak arrives and really isn't that interested in him now that since the beam is powered up. But you know, you should still try to kill them yourself right now and not leave it to your guards that were defeated by having the literal rug pulled from under them earlier. During the fight, she leaps out of a hole in the wall and lands on Spirit, transforming him into Swift Wind. And now he can talk too. Man, imagine what would happen if she landed on a toilet. Would it become a porcelain throne? Meanwhile, He-Man decides to take the direct approach against Hordak. Unfortunately, Hordak pulls the lever and it looks like Whispering Woods is done for. But luckily, she counters the blast with a huge rock. Before Hordak can fire off another shot, He-Man does his thing, and this leads to possibly the best line in the film. Well, Rebel, you smashed my magna beam and saved your worthless friends. So I did. Pretty good, huh? For some reason, that line reading just kills me. Anywho, by doing that, all the slaves and hostages have their willpower returned again. Before a surrounded He-Man can be blasted to hell, She-Ra saves him and tells him something shocking. Thanks for the rescue. By the way, you were just in time. Well, what are sisters for, anyway? Sister? What do you mean? He-Man, I think we have a lot to talk about. I wonder what went through Adam's mind here. What? We're related? Crap. Well, I guess Tila's my only option now. Once they get situated, the sorceress delivers a FaceTime message telling them their backstories. Basically, the queen had twins and Hordak leading the Horde tried to take over the kingdom, during which he tried to steal both babies, but only could get one. Hey, look, it seems Skeletor was a minion of Hordak too, and when the kidnap plan was botched, with only getting Adora, Skeletor gave up the goods on the Horde. So basically, he's always been like this. After tracking Hordak down, they still couldn't get Adora back, and Hordak escaped. The sorceress then proceeded to erase the memory of everything the Horde did and of Adora. What? Okay, now I'm going to assume that the story for this film and She-Ra happened way after the He-Man series was on here, and I'll give it some credit for trying to fix some plot holes, but come on. Also, the sorceress said that she also wiped Adam's mind. Why? 
He was like five minutes old. He's not even going to remember her. I find this crazy for a couple reasons. One, I assume some death and destruction was caused by the Horde. So what did the sorceress do? Did she undo all of that? Unlikely. Eternia is a big world. I'm sure other lands would still know about the Horde and how the king and queen had twins. I doubt the sorceress' power is so powerful that the entire world would forget. Two, why have everyone but the king and queen, man at arms, and the sorceress forget about Adora? I don't see the benefit to that. Did they think that people would risk their lives trying to find her, especially Adam? Per the sorceress, Hordak escaped to another dimension. While magic exists in this world, most people can't use it and wouldn't be able to use it. This seems as silly as in Frozen wiping Anna's memory of Elsa's power. Instead of doing something else like, oh gee, I don't know, teaching her how to use and control her power? Sometime later, Adam and Adora return to Whispering Woods and tell everyone the good news. We're getting married, uh, no, no, actually we're siblings. Yeah, yeah, the, that's the ticket. After that, Adora announces that she will join the rebellion. Immediately after that, we find that Glimmer wants to save her mom, the queen, Angela, from a bunch of harpies. It's been years since I've watched the original He-Man and She-Ra series, so I don't know, but I'm going to assume that the Harpies are the secondary villains of the show. They take care of the means by using some Loon Tunes physics, which leads He-Man to other this terrible line. I'd say that was a crashing success. <laughs> well, after some shenanigans with the Harpy Queen, they cross the streams to beat her. So they save Queen Angela and reunite her with Glimmer. Now the Rebellion has its leader back and should be stronger than ever. It's right here that I run into my biggest problem with the movie. It should be over. Okay, so maybe it should go on for a few more minutes, but it should be over. Yes, we should get to sing with Adora's reunion with her parents, but how long should that take? Four to six minutes or just show it over the credits? Nope, we still have almost half an hour left in the film. So that means this last third of the film is going to be trying to find a reason to keep a door in Etheria. My padding sense is tingling again. Right as Adam, Cringer, Adora, and Spirit go through the dimensional gate, Hordak throws a tantrum and sneaks into it as well. Why after they arrive is the sorceress looking like that? Well, once they leave, Hordak comes in. Shouldn't she have shut off the door before she left? But then again, if she did, the movie would be over within the next three minutes. Adam shows everyone his surprise and somehow Man at Arms, the King and Queen, recognize her. Well, after that, the King makes this pronouncement. The royal family of Eternia is all once more. And by the ancients, I swear that nothing shall ever separate us again. Okay, how are they going to explain to the rest of the kingdom that got mind wiped decades ago about who this person is and why they don't remember? Uh oh, I'm starting to get some DC Comics Identity Crisis flashbacks again. Meanwhile, Hordak makes his way to his old neighborhood and sees that Skeletor has taken up residence in it. After exchanging some pleasantries, Hordak offers a proposition. He'll leave the planet if Skeletor helps him capture the princess. What? Meanwhile, at the castle, Adora tells everyone the story about Madame Raz that she couldn't have possibly have known considering she's only met her about for the first time 12 hours ago. I could be mistaken though. The gruesome twosome crash the party and kidnap Adora. Just as Hordak is about to take Adora back, Skeletor betrays him. Gee, no one saw that one coming, right? Skeletor plans to hold her hostage against the kingdom. You know, in a flashback earlier, Hordak went through a portal to get to Etheria, right? So, Skeletor created this portal here to get back to Etheria. And Hordak just trusted him? That portal could have gone to the middle of a sun. Ugh. I'm starting to think that Hordak's not that intelligent. Anyway, Skeletor throws a door into the clink, but not before he says this line. No wonder Evelyn always gives him a sour look. After Adora feigns feigns, she tricks Beastman and escapes and retrieves her sword and becomes She-Ra again. She faces off against Skeletor and his men 
And, well, you've seen the show, so you know what's going to happen to him. It's at this time He-Man's crew arrive and are rendered pointless. I do find Tila's resting bitch face funny, though. It's better than Linda Hamilton's from King Kong Lives, but not as great as Mama Kincaid's from Abar the First Black Superman, though. Back at the palace, Adora tells the king and queen of her plans to go back to Etheria and battle the Horde, because that's been her home for years and the Horde needs to be defeated before she can come back to Eternia. Okay, that makes sense in a Chosen One kind of way, but shouldn't the film end right about now? We still have over 11 minutes left in the film. What more needs to happen here? At Castle Grayskull, Adora says her goodbyes to the sorceress, Cringer and Adam. But Adam, showing some Siskan tendencies, arrives at the last minute to help her get the rebellion off on a good foot. Sure, Adam. Sure. They make it back to Whispering Woods on to get attacked by some animals. Shira displays one of her powers and pulls a Wonder Woman, and the animals are willing to help her out. Over the next five minutes, we have the Rebellion battle the Horde. All goes well until Swift Wind bites it. It's okay though because Shira has the power of healing, except she doesn't seem to know she's doing it at first. The fight climaxes, or anti climaxes, with He Man and Shira confronting Shadow Weaver and Hordak. And instead of an action packed finale between these heavy hitters, the villains just fly away. There's three minutes left to the film. If you didn't want to have the four of them fight, then don't have this scene in the movie. So, with Bright Moon's status quo restored, Adam and Dora say their goodbyes. Farewell, Shira, Princess of Power! Farewell, He-Man, dear brother! The story is okayish. The whole finding a sibling or relative storyline is wrote by now, but it's not bad here. The acting is on par for the show. It's not horrendous or great, it's just acceptable. Unlike with GoBots about the Rock Lords, this actually comes off as a movie and not three and a half episodes slapped together. I wasn't bored watching this film, unlike with Rock Lords. The design of some of the creatures were okay. Ethereum didn't really differentiate from the world of Eternia, but I guess that's just what the toy company Mattel wanted. The real standouts, however, are the backgrounds and vehicle designs. The main reason I could stomach the limited animation was how fantastically and atmospheric the surroundings were. They looked like something from a 1970s to 80s concept album or fantasy comic. The characters were okay. Most of them are just archetypes, which is to be expected. The standout, however, is Adora slash she As Force Captain, she was serious and a bit twisted. I mean, look at some of these faces they gave her in the film. But she was also very capable. When the spell was broken, she came off as a more fun and loving and caring character as well. And as she she had a mixture of both. The soundtrack, score, and background music, none of it is that interesting. That being said, the opening theme and the closing theme, which is just the opening theme played again, is a real standout. I joked earlier that it sounded like a rehash from the never ending story theme, but I mean that in a good way. As for negatives, well, the animation. Just as with GoBots Battle of the Rock Lords, I have the same issue there that I have here. It's the same quality of the TV series. It's not any better. Also, some story points don't make any sense. Some examples would be the sources not giving the full lowdown for the mission. Adam suddenly having a sister out of nowhere. Next, the character design. This film, as most likely the series too, has an extreme case of same face, same body type, same hairstyle, different character syndrome. If it weren't for the clothes, you wouldn't be able to tell any of the characters apart. Also during the film, there are fades to black, which are conveniently timed, it seemed, for commercial breaks for when it appears on TV. While it's as if this wasn't made for the theaters initially, but for TV. It's not as bad as GoBots Battle of the Rock Lords, but it's still noticeable. Another problem is the voice acting. While most of the voice acting, like I said before, is fine, some of it is horrible. An example would be Queen Angela, Erica Schemer, gave such a stilted and wooden performance that I don't feel that bad about my own voice work now. I'm not even sure why she's that bad considering she was doing voice work as early as 1973 with the Brady Kids. Then again... 
Her last listed voice role was in 1987 to 1988 with She Were Princess of Power and Brave Star. So it looks like she was at the tail end of her voice acting career by that point. Another problem, the villains. The Hordesmen are sorry. Yes, yes, I know, just like all Stooges see the Stormtroopers, they have to be a bit incompetent, but this bad? They literally saw someone count down to pull the rug from under them. I'd say it's time to uh, pull the rug out from under them. One, two, three. Also, anyone can beat them. All you have to do is just step out of the way. Their look while toyic isn't practical. They're big and imposing, but that's it. Also, the naming of some of the characters. Some of them are just too spot on, like Sucker Face or Bo. At least the naming scheme isn't as bad as with the series Goblin Slayer, where everyone's name is their job. Example, High Elf Archer, Elder Dwarf, Sword Maiden, Priestess, and of course, the titler, Goblin Slayer. Yoinks. As far as recommending this, not really unless you're a fan of the original series. I can see people enjoying this film for nostalgic reasons, but because of the padding and limited animation, I don't see this film garnering any new fans. Another reason this probably won't work for many people is that this came off as several TV episodes stitched together. Once again, it's not as blatant as with GoBots Battle of the Rock Lords, but it had TV show transitions and fade outs. I thought maybe I was being a bit cynical until I checked up on this and the film was released in March of 1985. And then on September 9th to the 13th of 1985, the movie was broken up as a five-part series premiere for she -Ra. So the intention was always to have this as a TV miniseries. I guess Filmation released this in theaters as a way to get at least a little extra money from people, as well as promoting the new toys. It's been years since this film and the show itself, but the nostalgia, if not the popularity of the property has remained high though. There is the odd comic book series here and there based on Master of the Universe properties. Most recently, DC put something out about a year ago. Also, to this day, there are still girls and women wearing she wrote cosplay. So, the character is still noticeable. In fact, back in 2004-ish, when the He-Man anime remake happened, Adora slash she was supposed to appear in the not produced season 3. While that never happened, she did get a new anime series a couple of years ago and the response to it when it was announced was troubling and predictable. People kept saying how she was a boy, how bad the animation was. Forced diversity, feminism, bah! Well, the series is out now and personally from the clips I've seen of it, it looks good. She does look like a girl before and after transforming. When she transforms her body, it actually changes, which is good versus how before the only her wardrobe changed. At least Adam's skin got darker and his voice got lower as He-Man. The animation also has better movement. It doesn't appear to be as stilted like the 80s show. I just hope people give this new version of the character a chance. Don't love it or hate it without seeing it. I'll give it a chance once I can get my hands on it. That'll be a while since I don't have Netflix. One final thing. People have been asking, when will He-Man pop up on the new She-Ra series? And from what's been said so far, it looks like that won't happen because a different company owns those rights. That seems weird considering this is a Mattel property, right? Well, maybe not. See, in 1989, Filmation went out of business. Since then, several companies have bought various properties from the Filmation catalog. One of those companies being NBC Universal, aka The Dark Empire, uh, I mean Comcast. Well, there are other studios like the Westinghouse Broadcasting Group and so on. The point is, multiple companies have, they own different aspects of this property. And getting them to play nice is going to be difficult. And maybe even impossible by this point. Now, if the He-Man movie remake ever happens, then it might happen because by that point, all the companies may see that there's more money to be made then. Well, if you like this video, then please comment below, share, like it, and subscribe to the channel. And until my next video, have a good day.